All right, welcome back to Robinhood Stock Market Watchlist Group. This is our normal Sunday meeting that we do. Today is October 23rd, it is Sunday. Uh, we're gonna talk about, we usually like to talk about things that are gonna happen uh, in, the next, in the next week before it happens. I know a lot of people like talking about what happened in the past. Well, the past is the past. We already talked about that last week before it happened. So we always gotta look ahead and, and, and to know what's gonna happen before it happens. Because that thinking that way always gives us an advantage over the majority of other people. And so uh, one of the most important things that has one of the biggest impacts on the stock market is economic reports. So we always gotta usually start from the top and work our way down. So what this week has in store for us with economic reports is, uh, so for Tuesday, and we always get our economic reports uh, typically from investing.com. It's also, uh, not only is it a website, but it's also a, a free application you can download and so uh but this week has a good amount of uh of economic reports uh, unlike last week it was it was pretty light uh so uh but this week we're, we're definitely filled with a lot as well as uh, earnings uh, financial earnings reports that we'll get into uh, right after this so uh, monday it, there's nothing really scheduled for Monday. You know, Mondays is kind of a neutral day, just kind of depends. Uh, but, you know, a lot of us anticipate that, you know, Monday, you know, could be um, very bullish. And so, but we'll look into some stock options activity to see where investors are investing their money. Are they, are they, are they investing the market is going to go up Monday or are they going to invest uh, that it's going to go down on Monday? We'll see here in just a little bit. But for Tuesday, we have uh, Tuesday, October 25th, we have the CB Consumer Confidence Report for the month of October. Now, one way to kind of uh, uh, forecast uh, a, a, a volatility, measuring volatility with these reports is basically the more rare the report is, the more volatile that, that it's, it's going to provide. Uh, that day and so if it's a weekly report it'll provide a mild amount of uh, volatility if it's a monthly report it'll provide a good amount of volatility if it's a quarterly report it'll provide a lot of volatility and if it's a yearly report it could provide an extreme amount of volatility so so just know that and so this is a monthly uh, uh, economic report so it's going to provide a good amount of volatility and so one way to forecast if it's going to provide bullish characteristics or bearish characteristics is knowing uh, what the numbers that are in between uh, this area here so the previous support for example was was 108 so the forecast is anticipating it's going to be lower to 106.5 and so if it's lower obviously that is bearish if it's higher then it is uh, bullish and so if you're not sure what these reports are, and these are pretty repetitive, so I highly encourage you to, to, to click on them. A new tab uh, will appear with a paragraph and that lets you know uh, what it is and uh, how it can affect the uh, stock market. So for example, the CB means uh, conference board. Uh, consumer uh, com uh, confidence measures the level of consumer confidence in the economic activity. It is a leading indicator as it can predict consumer spending, which plays a major role in the overall economic activity. Higher readings point to a higher consumer optimism, and then how it can affect the market is a higher than expected reading should be taken as a positive or bullish for the U US dollar or the stock market, but it says should, but it doesn't always, uh, while a lower than expected reading should be taken as a negative or bearish for the US dollar or the stock market. Now, uh, the reason why I say should is because a lot of times, if it comes back higher than the forecast, but still lower than the previous, it can still provide bearish characteristics because it's still lower than the previous, even if it may be higher than the forecast. But a lot of times, what if it was still higher than both uh, and the market still goes down? Well, for some reason, you'll notice that a lot like Wall Street and, and a lot of investors, the majority of them still plan their day to be bearish, regardless if the uh, 
if, if, the, if the report came back positive. Typically, now it could be, it could work, you know, like normal, but for some reason it doesn't. It always seems to go, it's, it's because they're, they're already in uh, uh, bear mode, so they're just going to ride along uh, with it. And so, um, that's typically how that works and that's how we can really optimize this bit of uh, information so going to Wednesday oh uh, uh, for time that's another critical thing is knowing the times now when we're looking at the website it will usually default to the Eastern time uh, and so it just depends on where your time zone is it's very important you just kind of calculate it and know is it going to be released during pre-market or after the market opens that way you are aware uh, if uh, is it going to affect pre-market or will it uh, provide more momentum uh, after uh, the market opens so in this case so in the eastern time uh, the stock market opens at 9 30 in the morning this economic report is scheduled to be released at 10 a.m which is 30 minutes after the stock market opens now the first hour and the last hour of every day is the most volatile points of the day so this is just going to add basically fuel to the fire making it more uh, volatile so hopefully uh, uh, Monday is very very uh, uh, bullish and then going into Tuesday will be uh, morning will be very uh, bearish so uh, that's kind of what it's looking like here with that algorithm uh, and then going into Wednesday we have uh, the new home sales now uh, the existing home sales kind of holds the majority of the uh, you know the the real estate you know revenue and whatnot, but uh, but it's still that they, they'll look at the the uh, the forecast and see that it is you know it, it's slowing down now. Uh, uh, I think last week it, it actually, I mean, not last week, but last month I think it it, it went up. Um, uh, and even though we want to be realistic with these numbers and and because we're, we're seeing more homes with for sale signs in them and uh you know they're, they're just sitting there and uh you know the interest rates are go going up you know it, it, it's too expensive to to buy a home but for some reason the lenders or, or the, the, the whole fine the the um uh you know the real estate business could be manipulating their uh their their figures by maybe uh lowering their their uh, loan standards maybe they're they're providing loans just pretty much to anybody now uh with no credit or bad credit or whatever you know uh just like they did in in, in uh, you know, uh during uh, before the housing crash in 2008 and what that does it fluffs the numbers making it look like oh the housing market's fine you know you don't have to worry about it it's it, and, and so uh, but last month, I mean, it was unusually high. I mean, that was just really weird. But still, we see that the forecast is lower than the previous. We, and so we, we just have to focus on that uh, for the most part. Uh, and this report is scheduled to be released 30 minutes after the stock market opens. And so that may provide uh, you know more um, uh, bearish characteristics now same thing with the crude oil inventories which is a weekly report so it will provide a mild uh, uh, effect but it's still a major economic report and this report is scheduled to be released one hour after the stock market opens so we, we get kind of a little bit double whammy during the first hour uh, of the day and uh, this report there's a couple reports where we need the numbers down now this is bouncing up from uh, where you know uh, from it going down um, you know last week and we talked about this during our last meeting and how we're now kind of anticipating some big uh, uh, movement so most likely this is probably gonna be like five million six seven who knows but we're, we're kind of at that point where you know I mean even though gas prices are, are, are coming down I, I think we're seeing this 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 algorithm where uh, most Americans are, are paid every two weeks, so they're they're filling up at their favorite gas station, making it last for, for two weeks. Um, and uh, so we're seeing a lot of people fill up one week and then not filling up the next week and then filling. So we're seeing this, this huge uh, swings in the uh, oil inventory levels. One week it's high, one week it's low. And so with, with it being high, that is bearish. So we're, we have two bearish uh, economic reports for Wednesday which should provide 
uh, a, a lot of uh, and the other thing too talking about Tuesday and Wednesday is that Tuesday and Thursday are our QT days which is also called a quantitative tightening day and so uh, these days are scheduled for the government to sell billions of dollars worth of stocks. It could be five billion, it could be 10, 15, up to uh, 20 billion dollars worth of stocks. Now, they can do it during pre-market, they can do it during the regular market hours, they can even do it one second before after hours closes, which can be very tricky for us. Uh, so, uh, but as long as we are aware of these situations, we know you know how, how to play it and so uh if it's if it's pre-market you know there's going to be a huge significant drop and the rest of the day is going to be very very bearish uh but th usually what they like to do is they like to sneak in the quantitative tightening uh into some kind of bad news that way they can blame uh it on that news rather than the government or the news companies talking about oh yeah the government is selling billions of dollars worth of stocks we don't hear that and so they don't because they don't want us to really know about it and so uh so if if it does happen during the middle of the day like i said it usually happens with some kind of you know uh news it could be uh, during the economic reports or, or something or it could happen during a when biden talks or uh, during a press conference uh, but a lot of times uh, what we'll see more than half the time it's executed during uh after hours and and usually if it's even done at the last second before after hours closes we don't see an effect uh, of it on that scheduled day but it does carry over to the next day so if they do execute quantitative tightening on tuesday uh, during after hours that'll affect when that'll greatly affect uh, wednesday uh, same thing with thursday if, if they execute it on thursday it'll greatly affect uh, uh, friday now just like last uh, week when they kind of when they did that on thursday uh, there was a massive drop on uh, friday but uh, it uh, and and but it was quickly recovered because when the government sells billions of dollars worth of stocks if somebody else decides to buy billions of dollars worth of stocks it can easily uh, re recover that especially you know if, if the government's only selling five billion ten billion fifteen billion you know there are some other companies that can group together and and, and and pour a bunch of money into the stock market system it doesn't happen very often that's a lot of money so they really have to plan on that but you know and, and that happened last friday and, uh, and and they succeeded but like i said that's very very rare that's not going to happen uh, regularly so uh but that's one of the reasons why we straddle because we're always prepared for uh, any type of manipulation and so going into thursday thursday october 27th uh, we finally have some reports that are scheduled to be uh, release during the pre-market one hour before the stock market opens and out of everything here Thursday looks like it's going to be the most volatile day because of the G uh, the GDP quarterly report and as I mentioned before in this meeting that the more rare the report is the more volatility that it's going to provide uh, the whole entire market and so but starting with the top is our is our core durable goods orders which is a month over month uh, for the month of September and so this uh, the previous report was at 0.3 percent this is uh, scheduled to be a, a little lower 0.2 percent which is telling us be prepared for bearish characteristics on Thursday and then but for the GDP and this is this could provide you know some mixed signals too but but the, the quarterly report is going to ultimately provide the the, the most uh, characteristics the most uh, potency the most you know and but it's interesting because the gdp has a lot of information related to uh are we in a recession blah 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 and and because it really you know uh talks a lot about that and when you can see that the uh you know w when we're talking about you know things like that it, it, it they usually say that you know the the, the two uh quarters that have a uh, an economic decline in growth uh, is considered a, a recession, and so we, we've kind of seen, you know, uh, a, a pretty good amount of decline in economic growth uh, during the first quarter and the second quarter. 
However, uh, with the 27th coming up ahead, it's saying that uh, we're going to be in the positives, which is really very, very interesting. Look at this, 2.1%. It's like, how in the world? So this is saying, be prepared for bullish characteristics. I don't know how or why, but you know, it is what it is. And we, we always follow the money. We always follow the numbers. And so, um, uh, so yeah, just be prepared as a lot of people that aren't into this kind of stuff, they're going to be prepared to be bearish. We need to be smarter than that. And, and like I said, follow the numbers. It, it is what it is. We, 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 we make sure our emotions and our feelings are completely out of this. We, we think statistically, analytically, and strategically. And so, um, so we just have to be prepared. And then the unemployment report is the initial jobless claims. And so this is another weekly report. So it's not gonna have as much of an effect as you know the quarterly report and the monthly one. But it is saying, and, and recently the unemployment level has been kind of falling, uh, which uh, I'm sure the government is trying, the government's trying to get everything to crash. That way they can try to lower the inflation that they originally increased. And so, uh, but for it to be successful, they need everything to crash. They need unemployment to come up, blah, blah, blah. And so, uh, but lately it just, not everything has been working. Uh, so that's why they're still eager to do interest rate hikes. But uh, but their forecast, you know, just one more massive great one, uh, you know, this November, we may slow down the interest rate hikes, meaning where, uh, so uh, here in about two weeks, the interest rate hike, we shouldn't have another uh, uh, three quarters of a percent interest rate hike. But in December, you know, it's anticipated, it'll probably slow down to about maybe half percent and then going into next year, uh, hopefully we'll have a schedule on uh, on, on uh, how many interest rate hikes that they'll that they'll do. But um, but it's anticipated that it's going to bounce up, which is uh, bearish. So this is a report where we need the numbers down for it to be bullish. And so, but if it going up, uh, that is uh, bearish. But like I said, this cute this GDP report that's going to dominate the whole day you know it doesn't what it or almost it doesn't even going to matter what these other two reports are going to be this one's going to crush it you know whatever news is going on i mean bam and so but that would be a great opportunity for them to execute the quantitative tightening that way they can just blame it on on the gdp report blah blah, blah and whatnot so i definitely anticipate that it is exactly the way that that's going to happen uh, and then so Friday, uh, October 28th, uh, uh, one hour before the stock market opens at 8.30 Eastern time, we have the core uh, PCE price index month over month for the month of September, which is uh, uh, forecast to be up about a half percent, 0.5. Previous report was at 0.6. So anticipate bearish characteristics from that. And then we have the pending home sales month over month for the month of September, which is scheduled to be released 30 minutes after the stock market market opens at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, previous report was at negative 2%. It's anticipated it's going to be down negative 5%. So they're just going to talk about more about, you know, slowing down home sales and high interest rates, blah, 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 whatever, you know, that, that creates fear for the market that uh, it, it results in people selling. And so uh, Friday could easily be uh, a uh, bearish day, especially if a lot of the news from Thursday kind of carries over. And so a lot of investors usually don't like to hold throughout the weekend uh, uh, sometimes because because the weekend news obviously can affect uh, Monday. And so, uh, but the week after next, I think is going to be, uh, well, that's the interest rate hike. And so, you know, next, next week is going to be um, very volatile as well, but we got to focus on uh, what's going, what's in front of us right now, and this is going to be a very, very extremely volatile week, just from the economic reports. And so let's take a look at the um, the um, the financial earning releases coming up uh, this week, which is going to. I mean, this is our you know like our Fang week. This is this is like the Super Bowl uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, stock market. And so uh, so and all my posts I post are saved in our featured area in the top of our group. And so I've been doing this. Uh, created this group four years ago. 
uh, and, uh, and and built this consistent schedule of, of posting a lot of highly valuable uh, information. So every Saturday I post our, our weekly uh, upcoming most anticipated release earnings. And so there's a lot of major names on here um, and, uh, and a lot of them will affect each other. And so, um, but uh, it is there uh, for you if, if you want, but the top 10 are basically going to be our Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, uh, also known as Facebook, Alphabet, which is Google, UPS, Shopify, uh, General Motors, Coca-Cola, and Boeing. And so uh, I always post the, uh, the top 10 analysis shortly after that. And so Apple, which is scheduled to release their earnings on Thursday after the stock market closes, the company's earning lease has a 59% expecting an earnings beat. And, and usually around 60% is average. Usually about 65%, I would say, is, is, is average. So it's just slightly below average. And But option traders are pricing in around 5.5% price movement on this one, which is about almost twice as much as what it normally does. So we do expect some a little more volatility uh, out of Apple. Now, Facebook is, is, is you know going through a lot of uh, stuff right now, but... Uh, uh, they are expected to release their earnings on a Wednesday after the stock market opens. And so the company's earnings release has a 43% expecting an earnings beat, which is definitely below, well below average. But option traders are pricing in around a 13.5% price movement. So out of a lot of these uh, earnings, they're really going to be focusing a lot on, on Facebook uh, or uh, Meta. And so as a... Uh, you know, as an option trader, you know, we it, it's we have to be very careful with earnings because uh, if things don't work out due to uh, maybe uh, the earnings were uh, released uh, as a leak or uh, released early, you know, in the middle of the day, that can really screw things up. Uh, or if the stock doesn't move at all and uh, it will devalue both your calls and puts. So that's why it's important as a option trader that uh, that we utilize the um, the earnings reports as a lottery play meaning uh, you invest light very lightly just in case things don't work out and you lose a, a significant or a, a, if you lose on both sides it's not going to be a, a significant amount of money just like if you were to buy a lottery ticket whatever amount you put on there you're you're hoping that you know things will work out but it, it's money that you're not going to miss if if, if you lose it all and so, but, uh, but when we're looking at this as an option trader, we gotta be very smart. And, but also we want to uh, uh, look for things that are, that are anticipated to have big movements. You know, just like Snapchat uh, last week. We, we talked a little bit about Snapchat in our, in our uh, chat rooms. Uh, and I had anticipated that, yeah, it has a 50-50, uh, I would say a 50-50 expected uh, an earnings beat or miss, but I anticipate that it was going to move around 10 to 20%. And so and it, it blew past 20%. And so, uh, but social media is a huge, uh, you know, uh, 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 volatility thing going on uh, right now. And so uh, Facebook is next this week. And so, um, you know, it could go up or down. I mean, who knows? But, you know, it, it's more likely because if we look at this, 43% expecting the earnings beat, meaning where 43% is going to go up or 57% chance it's going to go down. And so, uh, but either way, option traders are pricing in around, you know, some massive volatility. So if we straddle, uh, if we bet both, it goes up and down. Now, we can only lose what we have on one side, but our gains on the other side are potentially uh, unlimited. Uh, as long as you know we don't get an uh, implied volatility crush with this, we could potentially gain thousands of, of percents on one side and lose only 100% on the other side. So that gain on the other side washes out your loss and puts you ahead. So that's why we always encourage straddling. And so, uh, but yeah, expect a lot of volatility from uh, Meta. Now, Amazon is expected to release their earnings report on Thursday after the stock market closes. The company's earnings release has a 60% expecting an earnings beat. However, option traders are pricing in some good volatility with this one around 8.5%. However, it moves around that, uh, and it has been lately in the, in the previous uh, earnings, so it, it's definitely a good volatile one. Uh, Microsoft is scheduled to release their earnings report on Tuesday after the stock market opens. 
company uh, earnings release has a 61% expecting an earnings beat. Option traders are also pricing in around a 6% price movement. Normally it moves around 3.5%. Uh, Google is also expected to release their earnings report on Tuesday after the stock market closes. The company's earnings release has a 61% expecting an earnings beat. Option traders are pricing in around a 7.5% price, price movement, which is, uh, which is a little more uh, from uh, what they usually do. Uh, UPS is also expected to release their earnings report on Tuesday, but uh, early in the morning before the stock market opens. The company's earnings release has a 37% expecting an earnings beat. As I'm sure fuel prices have, have gone up, I'm sure they're trying not to pass that expense off to its customers since they usually try to lock in a lot of their rates uh, <clears throat> you know, before every year. Option traders are pricing in around a 7.5% price movement uh, in either direction. <clears throat> and it normally moves, uh, you know, it's usually that volatile too. Uh, Shopify. <clears throat> Should be a pretty good volatile one. Sh uh, Shopify is expected to release their earnings on Thursday morning before the stock market opens. The uh, company's earnings release has a 55% expecting an earnings beat. However, option traders are pricing in a good amount of volatility at 12.8% movement. And it's moved around 10% uh, in the past. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, General Motors, uh, they're expected to release their earnings report on Tuesday morning as well. Uh, the uh, company's earnings release has a 33% expecting an earnings beat. <clears throat> that's pretty terrible, uh, <clears throat> but you know, uh, that's the automotive industry right now, going through shortages and microchips and metal materials and stuff due to politics. Uh, option traders are pricing in around 7% price movement in either direction, which is uh, a lot more than what it usually does so you know we'll, that we're going to see some some volatility in the automotive uh, and this is going to affect ford motor companies as well so uh we'll, we'll see what happens there and so and that's the other thing too when, when it comes to stock options is that one of our rules is to try to avoid uh, earnings unless we're certain that it's going to go in a particular direction or we can straddle uh, based off of uh, anticipating a lot of uh, volatility. But one way to try to avoid implied volatility crush is, is maybe to go for its competitor or something that's similar. Like for example, when Snapchat uh, released their financial earnings and they plunged uh, uh, you know, more than 20%, uh, Facebook had plunged uh, more than 5%. And so uh, so it just kind of works both ways. So instead of uh, maybe, you know, uh, straddling General Motors, we can straddle a, a Ford Motor Company. And so, but that's a great strategy on, on, on a way to prevent um, implied volatility crush while still participating in these uh, earnings events. So it's just a, it's a risk level that you have full control over. Uh, Coca-Cola <clears throat> is scheduled to release their earnings report on Tuesday morning before the stock market opens. The company's earnings release has a 55% expecting an earnings beat. Option traders are pricing in around 3 to maybe even a 4% price movement where normally Coca-Cola doesn't move hardly any. And so uh, Boeing, I believe, is our last one. Uh, most anticipated uh, uh, earnings this week, Boeing is uh, scheduled to release their earnings on Wednesday morning before the stock market opens. The company's earning release has a 56% expecting an earnings beat. Option traders are pricing in around a 6% price movement on uh, Boeing, where normally it moves about half of that. Now, uh, normally when we uh, you know, do our due diligence, it's always important to double check with investing.com because every Sunday morning they also post an article the top things to watch in the markets ahead in the week. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, just to make sure we didn't miss anything because we were very, very good at doing our due diligence because it's important that we always plan our trades and trade our plan. Uh, just like what Benjamin Franklin said, if we fail to plan, we're planning to fail and, and we will not fail uh, at this. We refuse to, so we always need to gain. We always need to, uh, <clears throat> you know, keep the ball rolling. And so we are like stock market ninjas. So, um, you know, this is part of our process that we got to do on a weekly and, and a daily basis. And so, uh, so the earnings season is ramping up. 
uh, up with the four biggest United States companies by the market value among those set to report results in the coming week. The United States is set to release their third quarter GDP figures, which are expected to show a return to growth after the uh, technical recession in the first half of the year. The European Central Bank is widely expected to deliver another jumbo rate hike of of basically a quarter percent on Thursday as uh, inflation in the euro uh, zone approaches 10 percent. Political events in the United Kingdom will remain in the spotlight as the Conservative Party selects a new prime minister. What a mess that was. Meanwhile, investors will be watching out for the delayed economic data from China after the, the President Xi uh, uh, Ping, whatever, consolidated uh, power for the historic third term on Sunday. Here's what we need to know. Now, it's interesting with the, the, the sheep, you know, whatever. China also forced, uh, I think, some other uh, leaders um, uh, among him as, as well. So that way he just doesn't have full control. You know, he's, he's got to have a kind of a group that somebody it's just very very weird what's going on over there so yeah the the first one is the uh is is the earnings which we kind of went over uh there's going to be you know some other ones that that we didn't talk about uh such as um uh well which are uh, which are all on here as well but the top 10 are like I said going to affect the the market the majority now the second one is the gdp which we had already talked about so that's always good you can always look through that uh, read that article but like i said just know that uh that it's it's um it, it could provide a lot of uh bullish uh, characteristics because investors could begin to they could kind of they may start to see the light at the end of the tunnel even though the tu there's a long tunnel but I think they may see a little bit of light at the end. And so uh, when they start to do that, they start pumping up the market. And so, uh, but, uh, so the third one is the, uh, the, the ECB rate hike. Um, and so, um, like I said, that's just gonna, you know, create some more volatility. But if, if, the, if the investors know that this is the last three quarter percent rate hike again they could begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel and they could be fine with a half percent rate hike and or a quarter percent rate hike and, and whatnot so we could see a little bit of uh, uh bullish characteristics for a little while but uh but like i said once they realize man this is a long tunnel we'll we'll, we'll talk we'll see the bears we'll, we'll see the bears again <clears throat> so number four is the uk political turmoil uh, and then number five is China. So we can always, you know, read through that. Uh, but also when it comes to uh, schedules, um, I always like to remind you guys that it's very, very important that we always know what's going to happen before it happens. But it's also important that we know what's going on with the president and the White House because they can also throw, uh, um, you know, um, Kind of a, a wrench in the loop and, and kind of you know stir the pot or or you know create some kind of volatility you know some way somehow and so but if you google joe biden's schedule uh, it should be the first one that pops up and it should look like this now they update this every day unfortunately it's not a weekly update because they basically create the schedule on the fly while you know as the day goes on uh you know and, and that's why you know there's no you know weekly in advance uh, notice and so but it is updated at uh <clears throat> at midnight eastern time or 9 p.m pacific time so if you're on the west coast that's a huge advantage for those <clears throat> uh that way while they're awake they can easily pull that up right at 9 p.m uh and and take a look at the uh, schedule that uh, planning ahead to see what uh, how because <clears throat> when we're looking at the economic reports those are all kind of in the morning you know they plan these things perfectly for a good reason to create volatility so uh the economic reports create volatility during pre-market as well as after hours these reports are typically scheduled during uh, uh during the middle of the day or <clears throat> during power hour and so that why it provides more volatility 
uh, and, and they could be doing it, like I said, on purpose. They, they could be throwing, uh, you know, some some verbiage in there that could create investors to sell or to buy. You know, if they start talking about companies, oh, Ford Motor Company, they're they're building, you know, new factories. <clears throat> they're planning on, uh, you know, recy battery recycling centers. They're gonna, uh, you know, hire four four thousand new employees. Blah blah blah. This is gonna help. You know, so all of a sudden, you know, they, they hear the, these key words and then they start pumping the, uh, the that, that stock up. And so uh, that's why it's really important that we watch these live and that and that way we know what rep uh, reports are, are coming out before it happens. We know what's scheduled to happen, rather than being that guy who depends on the news. You are leaving money on the table if if you're relying on the news because you got we are the news we're like the the journalists we look for the news before it happens we we we, we anticipate what's going to happen and then we we collect the information right when it's released now right when this information is, is released is when the news companies is receiving it at the same time we are now take some time to to collect that data and to type out an article or notification to blast it out through millions of people in, in, within their application or their newsletter or whatever. And it, that could take five minutes, that could take an hour. And meanwhile, <clears throat> the stock market is already reacting to the live information. And so that's where we have to be always current with our information uh, and so when these are happening, whether it's, it's a press conference at the White House, whether it's Joe Biden, you know, talking about something, we're on it live because it affects the stock market in instantly. And so, but a lot of times they can give us clues on what they could potentially say uh, about the, um, you know, the press conference or the, uh, the, uh, the when, when the president talks. Now, normally when it comes to the press conference, whatever that they're, going to talk about um, we have to think of well like a journalist what are the journalists going to ask the uh, because for example um, they could have a press conference or talk about uh, um, uh, the, the the college forgiveness loan stuff or whatever and, and once they start asking uh, once they get journalists to ask questions they won't even really ask about that. What's going on with uh, Russia? What's going on with uh, China? What's going on with uh, North Korea? You know, and so it, it, that could create fear, which could react to selling, and uh, and so that's why it's really important that we listen to it live because if you're not, I assure you, Wall Street and the rest of the investors are. And so you're just being left behind. And, and that is why this, all this information is highly critical and extremely valuable. And your goal ultimately is to become an, a successful independent investor and trader where you don't have to rely on anybody but yourself <clears throat> and a couple of devices. And so uh, these are just one of the little pieces of tools that, that we need under our tool belt. <clears throat> and so the next thing that we should do to, uh, is get into some stock options activity. But before we do that, does anybody have any questions? Any, anybody have anything they want to bring to the table? Or does everything make sense? <clears throat> if you have any questions, feel free to unmute your mic. You can verbal. Um, Talk. If not, I'm going to assume everything makes sense. We'll be able to move on. Excellent. Everything looks like it makes sense. So we'll move on to stock options activity. Because one of our rules is to always follow the money. And whether you're in the stock options or not, um, it still provides us a lot of valuable information on where investors are investing their money and at what strike price. So that way you have an idea. If you buy shares, it gives you an idea of what strike price people are, are betting that the share price is going to reach. But one of the first things that is important that we look at is the overall activity with the stock option system. Now, when we're looking at this during the weekend, this is basically going to be Friday right at close. So Friday, this is basically, it shows us under the bar chart website, under the most active options, Tesla had dominated uh, the entire list because it just had the uh, uh, earnings recently. And so, um, 
it had about 2.5 million in options volume, which is more than average. Uh, but between this, we have 53% calls, meaning they're betting the stock goes up, where 40, 47% are betting against the stock. So they're pretty much, you know, straddling, you know, 50-50. They're day trading, swing trading, you know, little little combination of everything. Then Apple uh, uh, is second place, and uh, Snapchat uh, is is third place. Snapchat is never really on this list. They're always on the bottom of the list. But like I said, they just had earnings, and a lot of people are uh, were, were trading them, as well as uh, getting ready to swing trade. But out of this amount of volume. And, and with Snapchat down 28%, they're betting, oh, you know, 58%. It, it's got to be coming up sometime either that day or most likely the next trading day, which would be uh, Monday. Now, uh, Twitter, which is part of the social media thing, it's not normally on the top of this list. It's usually on the list, but it's usually on the bottom of the list. But they're part of the social media um, um, you know, uh, industry. And so that's where we're seeing how that's being affected by uh, Snapchat. Same thing with Meta. It was affected by because of Snapchat. And so we can see some very high percentages on calls because uh, it's more likely that it, they're going to recover the next trading day, which would be Monday. And so, uh, but we can see the majority of the calls going into the next day um, uh, we can see that the majority are betting that the next day is going to be uh, 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 bullish. Uh, now, sometimes it could be the opposite. Maybe it could be a majority are, are put. So it's a good way to measure where the majority are, are thinking. Where are the majority putting their money? Are they betting the stock market is going to go up the next day or down the next day? Now, if you do ETFs, such as like SPY and, and whatnot, these types of investors or traders are, are are day traders. They get in and get out within seconds to, to, to minutes. And so when we're looking at this information, we have to think exactly that. These are day trading, you know, so they're basically they were they were pretty bearish, you know. There's not very many of these guys, you know, they, they swing trade into the next day. And so and a lot of them, because there's several expiration dates on ETS, there's three per uh, per per week, a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday. And so that's why you don't really want to look at this as much as you would uh, regular stocks because it, it stocks gives you just better uh, analysis. And so, uh, you know, going into the next day or, or whatnot, but, but we can see that a lot of them are bullish going into Monday. Uh, but like I said, the rest of the week looks uh, like it's in trouble. And so, uh, but sometimes we can see uh, when we're looking at this information daily, we memorize what's normally on here. What's normally on here is, is, is regularly traded because it's popular, you know, for, for very good reason. And so part of our rules is, uh, is always straddle no matter what, because uh, the day could, it doesn't matter if the stock market surges up one day or plunges down uh, uh, that day or um, because you can only lose what you have on one side, but your gains on the other side are potentially unlimited. So if you lose in the worst case scenario, 100% on one side, but you just gained a thousand percent on the other side, that washes out your loss and, and puts you ahead. And so, um, you know, uh, if, if, and, and, you know, but one of those rules is to always trade, you know, within the top five regular stock options. And that's normally going to be your Tesla, Apple, uh, Amazon, NVIDIA, AMD, uh, maybe even Meta. And so, but normally we had a lot of interference. Like I said, Snapchat's not normally on here. Twitter's not normally on there. Netflix is not normally on the top of the list. Uh, but it had uh, earnings recently, so we're seeing things kind of out of whack, and we're going to continue to see things out of whack uh, this this coming week. Uh, but that's why it's always important to look at this every single day. That way, you have it memorized. You know what's normal and what's not normal. If it's something that's not normal, uh, we can kind of you know maybe kind of watch it for for some reason. Maybe do a little bit more uh, uh, due diligence on it. You know. Uh, but but uh, but we're seeing a lot of you know great activity on Friday because uh, the last uh, several days before that you know the options volume was very little it was very unusually low but uh, hopefully this uh, volatility and uh, volume continues over uh, this week and so but it's also important to look at the most active individual calls and puts and we can find that here on the options volume leaders. 
So when we click on that, we'll, we'll see that here, but it's important that we identify ones that are expired. That way we don't focus on that going into this week. And so we have the expiration date here, but also DTE, which a lot of you will ask, what does that mean? Which DTE basically means the, the days until the option expires, DTE. Uh, and so we ignore the zeros, we focus on the next ones with the numbers. And so this is basically saying, so the most active one that's still current was Intel. And so, but they had uh, 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 earnings last week as well. So this is going to be some activity, you know, based on that. Uh, but Intel ended uh, Friday at twenty-six dollars and forty-seven cents. We have a thirty-five dollar call strike price that expires uh, in the beginning of two thousand twenty-four. So we got about four hundred fifty-four days from now until that expires. Now we have open interest, and now we have volume. Now I'm sure you're already aware that volume is today's buying and selling. Activity. But open interest may be new for you if you're not familiar with options. Open interest is a total number of open contracts that have been uh, traded but not yet liquidated via offsetting trades, meaning that these were options investors bought but are holding. They have not sold it yet. So, um, so if the number is lower than the volume, because the open interest is the is the previous day. Uh, the, the previous day's worth of combined people holding. Uh, the volume is, is always today's current buying and selling activity uh, and it resets back to zero every single day. And so that way it starts, you know, that current day's, you know, volume activity. And so, but when we see the volume number higher than the open interest, we gotta look at that as unusual buying activity because if it was at that or less than that, we don't know if that was just selling activity. Maybe they sold it, you know, because maybe they dumped it and got into something else, you know. But if the number, if the volume is higher than the open interest, that is showing that it is pure buying activity because it, is, it exceeds the open interest amount, you know, because you can only have 23,953 people sell, you know. And so, but if we have 78,000, you know, that is that just showing that we have almost four times the amount of people that bought into it, which the next day, going into Monday, this stock option, this call, $35 call, these two numbers will kind of merge together, you know, and so um, what we'll see more interest on this as, as time goes on. And so, um, because maybe these investors see the light at the end of the tunnel and, and they see the bottom with Intel now. And so, uh, so canoe, um, we have uh, a $4.16 uh, uh, share, but we have a $12.50 strike price. Now, if you were to buy shares of that, if you were working on this information <clears throat> to buy shares, especially at penny stocks, if it reached that, that just means you just gained 200% just from holding shares. And I don't know if they pay dividends, probably not, but if they were a dividend paying stock, not only are you holding on to something that's appreciating, but they're paying you a dividend every three months. And so, uh, but this stock also has the same expiration date. So uh, it does expire in, in the beginning of 2024, but if you're holding shares, it doesn't matter. Uh, but we do see an open interest of 71,000 in the volume of 62,000. So. Are, were, did they sell this? You know, who knows? We'd have to do a little bit more due diligence on it, but uh, but that's something you can decide if you want to do. Uh, Twitter, which is, at, there's gonna be a lot of news on Twitter as we get closer to the Elon Musk and Twitter's court date, um, which uh, we'll have to figure out exactly when that is. I think it's what, this week? Uh, but so Twitter, which is currently at $50.17, we have a $53 call strike price that expires this Friday, the 28th. Uh, we have open interest of 75,000, but uh, volume is only at 42,000. Uh, next one is another, uh, uh, I mean, a, a Tesla call. Now Tesla is currently at $211.96, but we have a $210 call that's already in the money. That expires this Friday as well. Open interest is only 13,800, uh, but we have a lot of volume on this one. So we know that people, a lot of people bought this one, holding it throughout the weekend uh, and uh, getting ready to sell. But we could see some straddling going on because we do see a $200 put strike price uh, right here with a very similar amount of uh, volume. And so, uh, 
but uh, so uh, these guys aren't taking any chances they're being prepared to straddle very very smart that's why we always straddle on a daily basis snapchat looks like a lot of people bought the eight dollar call going into uh, this week uh, with this expiration uh, this friday the 28th open interest was nothing only 361 now it's got a lot of interest three thirty eight thousand eight hundred sixty seven uh, in open interest. And then the last one is the, uh, I think it, uh, what was it, AT&T, uh, which is at $16.84. We have a $17 call strike price that expires this Friday the 28th. 14,000 open interest and now only 37,000 in volume. Now, another trick utilizing this particular page is rather than looking at things sorted out by volume, let's sort it out by open interest. Let's see what holds the majority interest of investors holding on to uh, stock options so if I click on it, it sorts it out I'll click the refresh page that way I can refresh the whole entire system by open interest so uh, GameStop is uh, first on the list uh, and we look at this regularly GameStop was not on the, the top of the list uh, in the last several weeks or months or whatever and now it is you know, with and, and it currently is at twenty-four dollars and sixty-one cents. What is going on here? We have a two hundred thirty-seven dollar and fifty cent call strike price that expires in three months, in January twentieth. Uh, it has a huge, massive amount of open interest of one hundred and forty-three thousand. That dominates everything else, with a slowly amount of uh, growing volume, whether it be up or down. Uh, most likely it's going up because as as we had mentioned it's trickling up the list and that's one of the reasons why we always look at this regularly because we can memorize it when we do that and so but we have noticed that bed bath and beyond has been trickling up the list and i think it's been around the top five now it's on the top three and it's currently at four dollars and 62 cents we have an 80 dollar call strike price that also expires in, in three months uh, very high open interest of 136,000 uh, volume is also accumulating. Uh, now, Bed Bath and Beyond has had a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, obstacles this year. It, it, uh, it, however, um, uh, and a lot of manipulation as well. And so, um, but Bed Bath and Beyond is a very favorite store for a lot of uh, consumers during the holiday season. You know, we got a lot of, uh, during the fourth quarter, we have Christmas, we have Black Fridays, we have a, a lot of uh, birthdays, we have weddings, and, and, and so on. Uh, and this is, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond's, uh, you know, prime time. And so, uh, as we get into the, um, the, the, the first quarter, when we start that, uh, you know, the fourth quarter uh, earnings season, um, you know, they'll probably do great. And, and, and even if it gets from $4.62 to even $10, that's a 100% gain. Now, normally Bed Bath & Beyond is what, a $30, $40 stock? And so uh, even if it gets to $40 by then, that is a huge significant gain in, in a matter of a short period of time. And uh, we sometimes can see this weird, you know, I call it flying under the, under the radar. We saw the exact same thing with GameStop a couple years ago when it was three, four, five dollars a share. It is starting to kind of trickle uh, 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 its way up on the top of the list, and so until it did what it did, and uh, but we're we're starting to see some similar characteristics. We just don't know are these going to explode or are they, they going to surge straight up, or is something going on uh, behind the curtains? Uh, but you know always follow the money be prepared because anything can happen uh, PBR uh, which is now holding its second place which is um, at $16.16 we have a $15 call strike price so it's already in the money um, but we do see that there are some other ones with high open interest we do see a $17 call but there are some puts in here as well so there may be a lot of uh, straddling because I think the PBR was that the whole Brazilian uh, oil company um, and so with oil being a very hot topic uh, there could be you know some 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 uh, you know uh, some activity with with the, with PBR so we may have to do a little bit more due diligence on why 
are people doing a lot of straddles with with PBR because uh, because we're seeing a lot of a variety of, of uh, almost an equal amount of calls and puts with with PBR uh, from right here that it all expire in um, also in, in three months and so but we do see uh, American Airlines uh, right here um, they have been slowly trickling down we've, we've seen a lot of uh, a long uh, uh, puts on them uh, it is currently at fourth place here. Uh, American Airlines is at $13.81, but we have a $12 put strike price that also expires in three months. It's been accumulating open interest. It's currently at $135,000. It's got $17,000 in, uh, in volume, which is quite a bit for, um, for this list. Uh, Ford Motor Company, which is at currently at $12.02, but we have a $12 put strike price. It's the only one on the list, and so, but we do see that investors are bearish with Ford Motor Company. You know, even if it once it gets to be in the money, if it starts getting under that $11, you know, this this $12 put is going to be very very valuable. And so we're seeing a lot of people accumulate that, especially as we were just talking about earnings, and with General Motors. This could be one of those, you know, uh, uh, you know, investors that are just preparing for General Motors to provide bearish characteristics, which will be in favor of Ford Motor Company's $12 put. So, and when we do this due diligence, we can start to see, you know, where the stars kind of start to align. We can see the little pieces of the puzzles. So that way, as we put them together, it makes a much clearer picture. Uh, so then we have Twitter. So Twitter on this list, which is Twitter is currently at $50.17, but we have a $30 put strike price and we have a $50 uh, put strike price. And, I mean, a call strike price, but we have a, a $40 put strike price. So out of this page, we're basically seeing that 66% of people are bearish and 33% are bullish. Now, typically, when um, a, a company, um, well, like with Tesla having to buy, you know, or Elon Musk having to buy uh, Twitter, we have to think of this, you know, financially and, um, and keep our emotions out because a lot of times bad news is, is good news. And so when we look at this with uh, finance wise, you know, as Tesla goes to spend billions and billions of dollars uh, to buy uh, Twitter, that is going to lower, um, um, you know, uh, Tesla's revenue and, and, and their, their, their bank account, basically. And so that affects the shareholders and they're not going to like that. They're going to sell. So it's going to have a, a double effect. And so but uh, this could help uh, Twitter uh, because uh, as they invest money into it, that money goes basically gets transferred over from Tesla to, to Twitter. So that increases uh, Twitter's bank account. Uh, and that could also encourage more uh, subscribers, but Tesla or Elon Musk has also mentioned about removing users. And so, but users are one of the key factors of, of the social media's platform's value. So the more users that there are, even if they're fake users, they're still a, a user. They, they manipulate that number so they can say, oh, we have billions of active users, blah, 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 when, you know, half of that's fake, you know, but, you know, their numbers are numbers. And so the only way to really uh, to get around that is to do like a user verification by doing like a phone number verifications or something, you know, other than what they're doing now when anybody can create multiple uh, accounts. You know, you can't do that when you have a phone number verification process. And so, but it sounds like um, that Elon Musk could implement something that could create more genuine users rather than bots or, or, or you know, fake people that like, or uh, people that like to create, you know, 10 or 20 profiles for, for their, you know, schemes and what, what not. And so, uh, but again, this is a very great, you know, tool to utilize for your advantage. And so, uh, but if you're looking at maybe more in a particular stock option, I usually use a NASDAQ website uh, for that. And so uh, NASDAQ has a, an options chain area where we can look at the most active individual calls and puts. And so uh, and we can change the ticker in the URL address just to make it even more convenient. That way you can just bookmark one uh, uh, link and change the ticker and boom now we can look at facebook's most active individual calls uh, and puts but uh, it doesn't show the expiration date on each row we actually have to click on them 
uh, to uh, determine um, you know what the expiration date is uh, on that and so uh, we like for example there's an $80 put strike price for Facebook that's super super low but we'll see that the expiration date is right here so we have March 17th of, of next year and so um, that is very very bearish and so um, uh, but we can kind of see out of the volume and a lot of this is probably expired uh, especially if we see uh, where uh, it's worthless, you know, a penny, you know, these are definitely expired. And so, um, so those don't really count as we're doing our due diligence, but uh, we can also look at the calls. That one looks like it's, it's worth, but this one has some value to it. So this could be something that's still active. So we can click on it just to see the expiration date is the 21st. So that one is definitely uh, expired. So that one is no good. So we go back and just keep kind of working our way down the list. So we can look at maybe the 140, see if that one's still active or not. And it is, it expires this Friday, the October 28th. So basically out of the 140, this one has the 100 in, in uh, or uh, almost 15,000 in, in volume. And if these are all expired, and if we go down, you know, the list here, you know, then we have 5,000 in, or, or so in, 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 in volume or whatever. But, uh, but basically, yeah, a lot of people are buying calls on, on Facebook and that way you can kind of track what call. Now, part of our rules, is to always buy our our strike prices at the money, meaning the share price. But if you just wanted to see what other people are doing, you know, uh, this is a good way to do it. That way you can also see what the expiration date is, because maybe it's a little you know further out. That way, if you wanted to go, um, you know, uh, uh, out of your normal daily routine and look for things. Um, uh, this is a, a good way to, to, to find that. But ultimately, straddling is our key strategy because uh, because of all the manipulation, all the crap that can happen. It does not matter if the stock market surges straight up or plunges down. It's a win-win for us uh, uh, every time. And so, uh, you know, you could be bearish, but straddling and you're just like, all right, yeah, I want the market to go down and all of a sudden something gets manipulated just like last Friday and all of a sudden it recovers. And then you're like, man, I'm so glad I straddle because it just doesn't matter if the market is red or green, as long as it picks a direction, it, it, it's profitable. And so that's why we, we like to utilize that. And, and But it's also important, like I said, to always know what's going to happen before it happens. Uh, just like we talked about the economic reports, the earnings, as well as quantitative tightening. Now, the, 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 the United States government likes to use the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for their bank account. And so anytime that they have what's called quantitative easing, which is where the government buys stocks, just like they did in 2020 when they, when they closed the economy down, uh, they forced the, the market to, to plunge. And here they were buying billions and billions of dollars worth of stocks. Well, now they're well that helped the economy well it helped the stock market to 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 uh not plunge as bad but uh but it helped create a lot of massive uh days that surge i which i call pump days uh now we have quantitative tightening which they're not selling they're not you know the money's a lot smaller than before they were dealing with hundreds of billions of dollars at a time now we're seeing you know five billion 13 billion uh, but for this week, uh, we do see that Tuesday, the 25th, that they do have scheduled to sell $5.7 billion worth of stocks. Now, on Thursday, the 27th, they do have scheduled to sell $13.6 billion of dollars worth of stocks. And so, but then the week after next, that, that's a big week because we, we talked about the week after next is, is the, uh, the, the interest rate hike. Uh, and whatnot, and uh, look at this. We have a massive twenty-one billion dollars scheduled to get sold. That's the highest out of I think out of this whole quantitative uh, uh, tightening uh, schedule, which lasts all the way up until uh, next year. And so, but it's not going to be as aggressive because right now we've been experiencing two quantitative tightenings per week. But after this year, it'll then be reduced to one one time a week. Uh, and then once every couple weeks and then until once a month. So as we get closer to that, to next spring and summer, the investors in Wall Street will be more like uh, they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And they'll become more and more bullish. 
And so I definitely anticipate that next summer is we're going to have a very, very rapid, bullish, strong season. Uh, but, you know, we, we have to, you know, but, but that's the other beauty of straddling is that it doesn't matter what type of season that we're in. It, it's the same process every time. Unlike any other strategies, we have to we have to acclimate ourselves for a whole new characteristic. So a bullish characteristics or, or bearish characteristics. But when you get used to being one sided, you know, you're, uh, it, it takes time to switch yourself. Now, if you just straddled day after day, you know, it doesn't matter uh, whether the, the market is up or, or down because we're, 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 you know, we're used to it. We're used to this volatility. We can, we can play it out in either direction. And so, but that's why it's really important to know again what's going to happen before it happens. And there's all this very valuable information. Hopefully, it makes sense. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Want to bring anything to the table? Um, I do have uh, my Weeble app. I mean, it's a, on the website up too. If, if you guys want to look at some stuff or moving averages, if you guys want to help uh, set up moving averages, want to talk about moving averages, you're buying and selling signals. Oh, yes. So I've been monitoring that for a while. Um, God, I thought I posted it here somewhere. But uh, so I have been watching it for a little while. And uh, the um, let me see, I'll post it in our chat room. That way we, we can talk about it. But uh, it's. It, it does seem to change a little bit with, with news. So uh, I'm going to start posting it about every week because it does seem to change a little bit by what what's kind of going on. And, and it, it can change. You know, if, if something new happens that can change the uh, the outcome of things, then what happens is that the, the whatever computer algorithm, the artificial intelligence now recalculates a new forecast. So I definitely want to be uh, 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 informed of that. I want you guys to be informed of that. Uh, and that's definitely something that we're going to, uh, I think, talk about as well. I just have to, um, I have to just try to, to uh, memorize, to kind of put that um, into our, our schedule. And so, uh, but I did uh, put it in our little chat room here. So that way we can kind of look at it. We can talk about it. Uh, this is kind of what their update is now, uh, which is kind of interesting because I think I noticed it changed as of last week when when the news came out saying that uh, that we may be doing just one more three quarter percent interest rate hike and it may be slowing down after that. And that's when I think I started to notice that we started to uh, we started to see some bullish characteristics uh, for the fourth quarter. We see that the October is now forecast to be 4.71 higher than uh, than the previous month, which was the, uh, the month of September. And then uh, November should be 6.78% higher than, uh, than September. Uh, but December looks like now we're going to be going down. We're down like uh, 5%. So December looks like it, it could be very, very uh, bearish. And it usually is. December is not only the, the, the last month of the year, but it's also the last month of the quarter. It's the last month of the season. And uh, December is also scheduled to have, um, uh, well, another interest rate hike, uh, but also uh, a triple witching day is the third Friday of every uh, last quarter. And so um, so December, expect that the market to be down 5% for sure. And then January is going to be down even more. Another, uh, well, you know, 3.5% uh, compared, well, from, from last uh, September. But f between these numbers here, this is basically saying that January should be what, like, or five percent less again so another five percent drop so we have two months where the market goes down ten percent that's that's quite a bit but then we see a little bit of a recovery on uh for february you know bounces up then march bounces back down but you know it, it, it you know, especially with this stuff here you know like the it, it, it's not accounting the election and stuff so we don't want to go too far into the future 
but it, it can provide us some insight for maybe the next you know uh, three months six months 12 months um, but you know it, it does change just know that uh, as, as things happen and that's why we want to look at it to see what it's most likely going to do in the near future rather than the late future so hopefully that so, makes so sense. Any other, okay. What was the second question? The first, the first question, question was the website for the report. Uh, the second question, um, you said, said that uh, the election, the election uh, is going to affect uh, the stock market. So if, if like, the, the midterm uh, next month, uh, um, uh, the Republican one, do you think it's a good, it's a good news, news or bad news? So the market always seems to favor the, the Republicans. So uh, most likely this will be uh, bullish. And so that may be also the reason why we're seeing some, you know, bullish characteristics for, uh, you know, the remainder of this month or, or as well as November, you know, but uh, because, you know, a lot of people are anticipating the big, you know, or the red wave is, you know, where we have a, a wave of uh, a lot of, you know, uh, people voting for re Republican leaders and stuff. Now, midterms, if, if those are not too familiar with it, this is really where we get to vote with a lot of state leaders, not so much, you know, federal leaders and stuff, but that that will be coming, you know, uh, shortly, you know, uh, going into, um, you know, well, 2024 or whatever. And so... Uh, but this will have uh, uh, some some volatility, you know, especially with the uh, with the excitement and, and the adrenaline and, and the news. People just pushing, you know, this and that, and whatnot. But you know, it, it, it should be a no brainer. I'm pretty sure that Wall Street investors are are, are pretty certain that the uh, that that the majority of the Republican votes are going to dominate, and so we should ex expect some some pretty nice bullish characteristics. Now, for the uh, the the uh, the source of this information is from a website called longforecast.com. If you Google it, you may get some weather forecasts, but you want to make sure you're looking at the longforecast.com website, which provides a lot of different uh, forecasts. And it could be commodity forecasts. It could be cryptocurrency forecasts. But like I said, we, we, we want to try to really focus on uh, you know the short term part of it because it, it doesn't always know what's going to happen in the late future. For example, uh, like I said, we talked about the you know the future elections, uh, the, the presidential elections in, in the late future. But also with Bitcoin, it doesn't it doesn't calculate the the uh, the uh, um, uh, the Bitcoin having events. Because if we were to look at the Bitcoin now, we have 2002 or 2022, 2023, 2024. We have the the Bitcoin having events that will take place in uh, sometime mid of 2024, which means it will probably it'll it, it, Bitcoin should reach over two hundred thousand dollars probably sometime around uh, 2025. And so, but we don't see that here. We do see that it's 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 up there, but we don't see it doing its normal thing after the Bitcoin having event. And so that's why it's important to know how to use these forecasts because, you know, th there's there's bits of missing information, but as long as we're aware of that, uh, you know, it, it just, it works, you know, it, wor it works well. But not, not only do we have cryptocurrency, but we also have exchange rates, uh, uh, cross rates, but we also have uh, interest rates. So if you wanted to see uh, like the uh, kind of an idea of interest rates uh, hikes, we can kind of look at this. Uh, but you know, it doesn't seem to factor in interest rate easing because yeah, we have interest rates uh, for the remainder of this year, 2022, but we also have a forecast of the interest rate hikes for the 2023. But starting 2024, that's when we should start seeing interest rate easing where they'll start lowering interest rates but for some reason it starts it, for some reason it seems to go up 
and so that bit of information seems false to me so we have to re you know it's kind of like a reading a magazine you don't always want to you know, believe what you read so we have to use some common sense by applying certain uh, scheduled events along with this because we know what's going to happen before it happens this kind of gives us an idea of what could it possibly happen along the way uh, but when these events happen, that's a whole new a story, a whole new you know forecast that we have to look at after the event takes place. Other cool benefits that this website has uh, is uh, stock indexes, in case you want to look at the S&P 500, NASDAQ, Dow Jones, or whatever. But we can also look at stock prices, like Apple, you know, big market cap stocks, like Apple, Tesla, and, and so on. So if we, look, if we click on Tesla, we can see this is kind of what uh, a lot of, you know, th this computer systems uh, uh, hypothetical analysis is, is thinking or predicting. And so, um, you know, but not including, you know, certain other, like if uh, Elon Musk decides to start taking reservation orders like next year for the robot, maybe they made a breakthrough. They did provide some clues for that, that Optimus robot that uh, I think they'll start to take uh, reservation orders in two years. So we're probably more like uh, you know, 2024 until uh, they'll start taking reservation orders and, and uh, selling millions of them. And so, um, but, uh, but for now, you know, it's going to be a bumpy road, as you can see, and it starts to go up. But like I said, this is it's, it's a very interesting. But I, I also use uh, um, uh, another when predicting stocks. I also like to use uh, a CNN website. CNN, you can do uh, a Tesla, uh, you know, forecast or um, yeah, forecast. And uh, that way, because they'll have a lot of, um, of their own analysis or their own analyst. Uh, to predict things and so we have uh, you know and they could be bearish or bullish or whatever but you know we have 36 analysis that are offering their 12 month forecast Tesla right now is at $214 but but the lowest side they're saying oh in 12 months Tesla should be $85 the high side they're saying oh Tesla should be at $530 but in the medium area they're saying Tesla should be around $316 in 12 months which should be about a 47% gain on that part so so in 12 months from now uh we're right here at, at 266 dollars so we have a little bit more ways to to figure out uh you know our our forecast by you know putting more pieces of the puzzle together but uh, another rare thing when utilizing the cnn forecast because a lot of times we'll see a high and a low but very rare do you see a low higher than the current share price. For example, let's take uh, NEO, for example. NEO is currently at $11.21. We have 29 uh, CNN analysts, financial analysts. And these guys, like I said, they, they are pros. The worst case scenario, they're saying 12 months, NEO should be at $18.66 or 65 cents. I can't read but that's 66% gain worst case scenario now most of these meet in the middle around $27.88 which should be about 148% gain best case scenario it'll go back to where it was before all this drama happened at $66.41 which would be nearly a 500% gain so again very rare do we see the highs and the lows higher than the current price now when you see that that is a you know that that's a no-brainer you know that you know it's it's th that this price is a heck of a deal so there's a lot of ways a lot of tools we can really analyze things and, and to do our due diligence to see uh, if it's a good value or what other people are doing and, and whatnot so hopefully this you know all this information helps as well as you know these resources just make sure that you bookmark these Anybody else have any questions? Anything you wanted to go over? Everything makes sense? Are you guys ready to rock and roll? One last, One last uh, question. question. I know, I know this is a start session, 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 but, session, but do you know anything, about, you know anything about, about crypto, crypto projection? projection? What's going to happen with this market? The, the, the crypto sector? Yes. Now, um, our group really, we, we like to focus on um, all kinds of things. We're very a diverse group, you know, where, whether it be uh, forex, stocks, options, uh, crypto, 
Now, one thing that's really, really important, I'm gonna to try to upload this really quick, is that cryptocurrency has a four-year cycle. The, the, the more that we understand cycles, the better of a trader and investor that, that we are. Versus a, a stock market has a yearly cycle and it has a 10-year, uh, like an economic cycle too. That's a very, very long one. But cryptocurrency has a four-year cycle and they kind of implemented that uh, when, the, when the creator of Bitcoin created uh, Bitcoin, he always he wanted to ensure that it was always going to appreciate uh, no matter what. But how do you get something to appreciate that doesn't really exist? And and uh, but but also to create a way to inspire people to always invest into it. And so he created an event called Bitcoin Having. And so uh, what that does is that it subtracts Bitcoin out of the system, but kind of leaving you know the the the, the money in there and so but when you do that it, it kind of like doubles the value but a lot of people want to take advantage of this financial uh, opportunity by pouring more money into it so not only does it double it quadruples and so this is the history that i've pulled up of the of the bitcoin having event now bitcoin used to be under a dollar at one point in time and uh, but over time, as more platforms became available, more volume got pumped into it. Well, after that certain amount of time, they, the Bitcoin having event took place. And then uh, usually we see a reaction within about six months after the, the Bitcoin having takes place. And then boom, it surges uh, from where it was around a couple dollars up to like sixty five dollars and then up to about five hundred dollars. Uh, shortly after the first Bitcoin having event, and it has these little, little sections, you know, throughout the f every four years. And so the next Bitcoin having event took place sometime late 2016, went from $500 up to like almost 16, 17 thousand dollars. But what we're seeing in a way is that the previous highs become the new lows. And so uh, if the previous highs was around 16, 17 or $18,000, then that means that that is our current new low. And it's been hovering around that 18, 19, $20,000 range for, for quite a long time now. And so, but the next Bitcoin having event, which will take place sometime mid of 2024, we should start to see record-breaking numbers in all uh, or a majority of cryptocurrencies because they all start to kind of follow bitcoin and, and because it's a it's a really good you know uh, opportunity plus in 2024 is when the when we're going to have a very long uh, bull season for the stock market so they're all scheduled to kind of uh, uh happen all at the same time and so, but, uh, but 2024, 2025 is going to be a great phenomenal year uh, for cryptocurrency. And I'm gonna show you uh, another cool image too, because um, if, if you've been in cryptocurrency for a long time, you'll see a lot of people that will say, oh, it's dying, it's dying, it's pointless, it's a scam, uh, you know, it, it's never going to you know, do anything anymore, it, it's not, and, you know, it's just a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of negativity, you know, it's a lot of emotion. Well, they're, they're impatient, you know, because they don't understand the, of how cryptocurrency really works uh, based on its algorithm and, and, uh, and its, uh, uh, its characteristics. And so uh, I like to always point out this image right here so 2011 you know when it fell down to a penny it was oh it's dying it's dying we should sell blah 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 well the smart ones were buying you know that's why we say buy the fear sell the greed and so uh 2015 it, it, it plunged down to 200 dollars. oh it's dying we should sell nope nope buy that sucker 2020 oh and you know it, it fell down like it's uh, to about 3800 bucks and everyone's oh it's dying it's dying well 2020 same thing right now it's dying it's dying well it's, it's under twenty thousand dollars because that's the bottom area well in 2025 they're going to say the exact same thing when it's a hundred thousand because like i said i just predicted it's going to reach probably 200 over two hundred thousand dollars but the, again the previous highs become the new lows. So most likely in 2025 or 2026, the new lows are probably gonna be more like 60,000, 70,000. Uh, it'll be under 100,000 for sure. Uh, but the new highs should be, like I said, about $200,000.
it's inevitable Bitcoin will reach one million dollars. It's not a matter of, of it's not a matter of if, but when it's going to happen. And you know, with this type of, uh, of, uh, of, of of momentum, you know, it could be ten years, fifteen years from now. And so, but it, it's going to happen. Uh, and 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 with but when it comes to Bitcoin having events, there are a limited amount of those. But we're like 150 years away from uh, from the end of Bitcoin having. So we're a long ways from, from that. But this is where this is a, a, a an opportunity of a lifetime to take advantage of when it comes to cryptocurrency. I just recommend to again always follow the money. And uh, when it comes to cryptocurrency, same exact thing. And so uh, we, we can go to like cryptocurrency, I think, uh, was it like market cap or, or something? Uh, it, it's a great website, coinmarketcap.com. So it put, it gives it, every single cryptocurrency is listed on here and it's sorted out by market capital. So we know Bitcoin is number one. We have uh, Ethereum, number two, Tether, three, and then so on uh, and, and so on. But usually it's recommended to stick with the top three, top five in, in, in really anything. And so, but if we continue to work our way down, we can see Dogecoin is number five uh, and um, uh, or Shiba is number 15. I believe that Shiba is going to be, is going to react like uh, Dogecoin did uh, during or after the next Bitcoin halving events. It's going to get manipulated again. There's a lot of investors before the last Bitcoin having event that was like, oh, I wish uh, Dogecoin would have reached one penny. And, and it did. And once it did reach two, and then four, and then eight, 10, 20, and then so on, we knew exactly what was going on. Uh, and, and, and then all Elon Musk you know, participated in it. And, and then he said, um, I'm going to go on Saturday Night Live. And then everybody was like, oh, he's going he's gonna to mention Dogecoin. Well, you know, buy on rumors, sell on news. You know, we, we, we told you guys that uh, the plan is to, as soon as he gets on there, sell because it's, because that's like the news. Buy on rumor, sell on news. So he gets on there, starts talking, and all of a sudden it reached, <clears throat> it surged like 60, 70 cents, and it plunged uh, down after that, and it has not been the same since. And so, uh, but I anticipate that <clears throat> Shiba is going to be the same exact thing because when that took place, just like GameStop, we had all these copycats. Well, you had a thousands of new uh, uh, cryptocurrencies that were under a penny. Investors and cryptocurrency uh, traders want a new Dogecoin. So uh, we had thousands of them. And uh, just like anything else, a, a lot of them usually fail, but one of them usually can slip through the cracks and here she is. Slipped through the cracks, now number 15, but it fluctuates between 15 and, and 10 just like Dogecoin. So just be prepared that this could be a, a this could easily, this will, this could create a lot of millionaires, just like Dogecoin did. You know, uh, it like, for example, if, if, if you put like, I think $20,000 on Dogecoin before it surged and you sold right before Elon Musk started talking on Saturday Night Live, you would have had uh, over a million dollars just from $20,000. And so, uh, so I highly anticipate Shiba could provide us another great opportunity just like that. So be prepared uh, as we get into 2024 and 2025. Uh, any other questions? Anything else anybody wanted to go over? Were you guys good? Everything makes sense? Ready to rock and roll? Make a lot of, a lot of gains this week? We're looking good. No, no more questions. Well, thank you guys very much for for joining. Um, I'm available 24/7. If you guys have any questions, feel free to message me on Messenger, uh, whether it's you know one-on-one -on -one or or in the uh, group. We're all here to help. So, um, thank you guys. We'll see you next week.